Hi, I'm Alyssa Rosenzweig, and this is a talk on the Open Graphics Stack. I am a graphics developer at Collabora, uh, leading the open source Panfrost driver for the ARM Mali GPUs. And in my spare time, I'm helping out with the Asahi Linux project, porting Linux to Apple's uh, M1 processor. And I'm uh, excited to talk about uh, the Open Graphics Stack here in the Embedded Linux conference. My goal for this talk is to help understand uh, what is involved on the Linux stack uh, for 3D graphics nowadays, uh, because there are quite a number of moving parts, and I hope by the end of this talk you'll understand each of the parts involved and each of the different layers. And I also want to uh, talk about how open source fits into this and why it matters. So first of all, before we can even talk about open source drivers or drivers 3D drivers at all, uh, we have to ask the question, do embedded systems need 3D acceleration? And since this is the Embedded Linux conference, uh, the answer is yes, they can sometimes. If you're talking about an 8-bit microcontroller, no, you're not going to want 3D acceleration for that. But for the uh, more complicated embedded systems uh, that we'd be interested in running Linux on, uh, we absolutely uh, can sometimes need 3D acceleration, need GPUs. Uh, th there's a tension here. On one hand, you have the embedded devices who, whose life cycles can be up to 20 years out in the field without uh, just working as they should, total stability. On the other hand, you have these very complicated user space graphics drivers, uh, and the closed source drivers have uh, end of life often as soon as five years after the product is released, which is quite a tension. Uh, even if it was 10 years, that's uh, no hardware vendor wants to support their driver for 20 year old hardware. Uh, with open source drivers, uh, the menu, you don't have to rely on the vendor, and that's one of the big perks for uh, embedded systems that need 3D acceleration. Uh, so if we convince ourselves that open source drivers are a necessity, both because the drivers themselves can be updated and also because they will work smoothly with mainline kernels and allow upreving kernels, allow using the LTS releases of the kernel, um, all of things which are greatly complicated, if not prohibited, with various downstream proprietary graphic stacks on Linux. Even if we convince ourselves we need this, uh, we have to ask then, are open source drivers here? Are they ready? Can we use them in our products today? Uh, can end users go use them? And the answer is an affirmative yes. And I'm happy to say yes, because uh, so many of these open source graphics talks over the years have been coming soon, TM. And uh, this year, at all the talks I'm doing, I'm giving a bold yes, and I feel confident with that answer. And I feel uh, very glad that we've gotten to this point. For any vendor you can think of, uh, whether that be Intel and AMD on the desktop side, Broadcom and ARM on the uh, ARM side, uh, or defaulting to reverse engineering on the ARM side, Qualcomm, Vivante, and Apple, there are credible reverse engineering projects in the latter cases and credible drivers in all cases uh, and all open source. And that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing to me is that covers uh, every GPU that matters nowadays. Uh, what, what's that? Something about imagination? Oh, well, last I heard, uh, there was a job posting about hiring uh, Linux graphics people, and I said relevant, so... The bottom line is that open source graphics is the status quo, and that's, that's a good thing for us, and it's a good thing for embedded Linux. So what does this open graphics stack look like? As promised, it's rather complicated, um, but hoping we can break it down. At the very top of the stack, you have the application uh, trying to do some high level rendering. This might be a game, or it might be a desktop, or a web browser. These are sort of the uh, more traditional applications you'd think of. In the embedded space, this might be a user interface of some kind. Uh, might be a, a instance of Weston running uh, for your Wayland compositor on a closed system. 
uh, closed is in contained, not proprietary. Hopefully, you can have an open closed system. Um, at any rate, uh, it's going to talk to a graphics engine, uh, which is going to mediate to the high level APIs. There are quite a few graphics APIs, but the uh, most common on Linux will be either OpenGL or Vulkan. In both cases, the engine will provide uh, programs to run on the graphics hardware, uh, known as shaders, and these will pass through the pass through the API down to the compiler. The graphics compilers are themselves very complicated stacks, going through multiple representations of the program, multiple, essentially, compilers within the big compiler, but the net result is going to be a binary uh, that can run on the hardware. Separate from this, or rather in parallel with this compiler stack, we also have the commands being sent to the hardware themselves. These can take two different forms. In OpenGL, you're presented with a state machine, which uh, some common infrastructure called Gallium has to then uh, sort of deconstruct into uh, much more rigidly defined states with descriptors and uh, more functional style programming almost. Or you can have, uh, you can specify those descriptors and those state objects directly, which is how Vulkan would work. In either case, these uh, state objects get passed to the backend driver, which will translate them into commands specific to the hardware, and then pass those commands off into the kernel. A driver in the Linux kernel will then just simply pass those commands off to the hardware, and you have your 3D rendering on screen. In terms of which software does which pieces, the applications and the, en the engines are going to vary tremendously, and there are plenty of open source examples of both. Uh, for the hardware, obviously there's no software there. For the kernel, that's obviously the Linux kernel. And then everything else on the slide is happening within the Mesa umbrella project. So let's talk about Mesa. Mesa, at its core, is a user space library for gra writing graphics drivers and for providing a graphics driver. It implements a number of different APIs, OpenGL, OpenCL, and Vulkan, to name the most important three. And it has tons of common infrastructure used to implement these APIs. Uh, most importantly, it has the Gallium infrastructure, as I mentioned. Uh, this consists of common code uh, for dealing with uh, the OpenGL and OpenCL APIs and translating them into something more amenable to hardware drivers, as well as all of the Gallium-based drivers themselves. Separately, there is the NUR compiler, where NUR stands for the New Immediate Representation. Well, it was new when we came out with it. <laughs> um, and uh, NUR is our common form for shaders in, in the middle of Mesa. And then, of course, we have compilers that translate from NUR into the hardware uh, instruction sets for all of the different hardware you can think of. And the net result is that Mesa provides the user space component of the driver. Uh, the net build will be you know, libgl.so uh, or an equivalent for Vulkan. And on one hand, in the front end, Mesa will implement this API, OpenGL or Vulkan, and then in the back end, after doing all of this compiling and all of this translation, uh, it will talk to the kernel using the standard system calls, um, which are different graphics flavors of IOCTL. Uh, Mesa consists of the most complicated part of the 3D graphics stack on Linux, uh, and it's become a sort of umbrella project. You can pick out several distinct sub-projects within the Mesa uh, mono repo. But uh, this is the home of our user space drivers, and it's a, I'm a Mesa developer, and I'm quite happy to be in the project. Of course, this is the embedded Linux conference, and the 3D graphics picture is not complete without talking about Linux drivers, because Mesa has no direct access to the hardware. Uh, any access that Mesa wants to do to the hardware has to be mediated through an appropriate kernel graphics driver. Uh, and this is simply for uh, both security uh, security and performance concerns. Um, 
and just stability. It, there was a time when user space display drivers ran the show and the kernel could sit back and that didn't pan out so well. Ask any X11 developer. So we have very small, well, so in the embedded space, we have very small kernel graphics drivers uh, that provide the common interface for the much more complicated, much larger user space Mesa driver. So the kernel drivers are built on a, a large body of common code. Uh, most importantly, the direct rendering management, DRM layer, and the graphics execution manager, GEM. And these are uh, common libraries within the kernel, essentially. They're within the GPU subsystem, uh, used to implement all of our 3D rendering drivers. As an aside, uh, these are also used in conjunction with kernel mode setting uh, to implement display drivers. In the uh, x86 desktop world, uh, 3D rendering and display are intermingled into a single driver because they're implemented on the same hardware. Uh, oftentimes, this is also mixed up with video decoding and video encoding, uh, all on the same G thing that a consumer would call a GPU. Uh, in the ARM world, in the embedded world, uh, we don't see this, the same sort of uh, cohesion of the part. Instead, you have separate uh, blocks on the system on chip for 3D rendering versus for display versus for video codecs. And as a consequence, you have uh, different drivers for each of these, and there is a sort of plug and play aspect at the uh, system on chip level, which uh, brings some unique challenges into the uh, graphic stack. So my point in this whole digression is saying that uh, this talk is really focused on the 3D rendering side, uh, which is uh, about DRM and GEM, not KMS. So for the next segment, I'd like to talk about the bird's eye view of what happens at each of these layers of the stack. I showed you the big picture, but um, let's go a little deeper, try to understand each layer separately. At the top, again, we have our application and our engine, which are using some API. And these are thinking in terms of drawing triangles and in terms of programmable shaders. Uh, generally, there are two types of shaders, and you need both. The first is the vertex shader, which calculates positions for all of the vertices in your geometry. And uh, the other is the pixel shader, or the fragment shader, which calculates the colors. And this is the programming model that most APIs are implementing and that hardware has a, a native support for. It's not perfect. It doesn't map perfectly to the hard, to all hardware. It's not necessarily the most comfortable programming model, uh, which is why people often will use an engine instead of uh, using these APIs directly. But it is a good trade-off between the requirements of every different piece of hardware and the requirements of every different application which might want to use the GPU. Of course, uh, there's more to it on the, on the hardware side, uh, because hardware nowadays is not working in terms of this high-level abstraction. Instead, there tends to be a uh, more descriptor-based setup, uh, either literally with descriptors in memory and pointers everywhere, in the case of the ARM Mali GPU, uh, or uh, less literally in terms of uh, state objects that can be bound at will, which is a much more uh, typical design um, on the with varying sizes all the way down to just register writes from user space. Uh, the bottom line is, though, uh, there has to be some translation from the uh, OpenGL concepts to what hardware actually wants. And uh, we have our front ends for this. This is Gallium helping with this, our drivers are helping with this. And you go from, instead of having a GL viewport, GL depth func calls, you instead have a depth stencil out object, a viewport state. Uh, and you can bind these and unbind these. And this is a much more natural interface for the hardware. And of course, you still draw triangles, triangles all the way down the stack. <laughs>
In parallel, we have our compiler, uh, which is organized the same way that uh, any compiler is organized, even for a CPU. Uh, you have your source code that gets parsed into an abstract syntax tree. The abstract syntax tree gets translated into some intermediate representation, which can be optimized with, for, with common code. And then once all of your common optimizations are applied, you can translate that into something hardware specific, which again can be optimized and finally translated into a final binary. And we'll talk in a bit on why we have so many layers and why that's a good thing. The driver itself uh, is doing all this translation as mentioned, and it also has the added wrinkle of having to deal with memory allocation, at least for OpenGL. For Vulkan, uh, this is not so clear cut, but uh, really the user space driver has three roles, compile shaders, translate state, and manage memory. And if you can get away with mem without doing any memory management, uh, you're down to only two thirds of a driver, which is <laughs> part of the buzz for Vulkan, I suppose, pushing that off into the application instead of having to do gymnastics in the driver to infer what an application would have meant to do in order to use the memory resources effectively, which is one of the big challenges with OpenGL. At any rate, all of this is feeding into a kernel, which has really two responsibilities only. One is implementing this memory application, because user space is just called, do making a system call to allocate memory when needed. Uh, it's up to the kernel driver to actually do the memory allocation, typically by programming a memory management unit for the GPU in order to map chunks of graphics memory uh, for particular use. Uh, in the embedded world, we're using unified memory, so the same physical memory can be used on both the CPU and the GPU simultaneously and for, with a shared mapping, which can be made very efficiently. And uh, there's, so this is just a matter of programming the memory management unit in the correct way. And then the other piece is to, of course, uh, actually execute the job, uh, which in the most simple case is a matter of pointing the hardware to a particular uh, place in memory to tell it to start executing commands or start reading descriptors or uh, however it's set up. Uh, the other wrinkle here is that uh, there can be many processes rendering at the same time using the same GPU. And if, if the car, the hardware can only, uh, run one process at, at a time or two processes at a time, uh, it's up to the kernel to schedule, uh, what, uh, how the GPU's time is allocated. And this is, again, a classic kernel responsibility, not just for graphics, but on the CPU, uh, one of these mere uh, common kernel responsibilities is mapping memory and scheduling processes to CPUs. So uh, there's some sense in which graphics feels like having an operating system within the operating system, uh, which is a lot of fun for some definition of fun. So with that bird's eye view, we can talk about what Vulkan brings to the table, because there's a lot of buzz about Vulkan, um, both uh, for high-end high, high -end games to very low-resource embedded systems uh, that need uh, 3D rendering. And so what is the point of all of this? Ultimately, uh, it's about lowering CPU overhead by with the big idea that OpenGL drivers have to do all of these gymnastics uh, to maintain this stack. Um, if you can pull out some of those responsibilities from the driver and make them the responsibility of the application, then the application has the potential to uh, do be more efficient uh, because it has more knowledge about what it's trying to do than the driver, which at best has to fall back to uh, its custom heuristics, which, as you know, uh, heuristic in computer science is a euphemism for wrong. So. That's kind of the point of Vulkan. The other change is that the GLSL parser is eliminated, um, which should excite the security people in the room because uh, parsing text is uh, one of the most error-prone tasks in terms of 
uh, subtle buffer overflow type bugs. And remember, the user space graphics drivers are giant chunks of C code. And at one point, you could say, well, they're not, they don't have any privileges, so it's fine. But now in the era of WebGL, um, there is a real privilege escalation path and where driver bugs uh, can turn into security vulnerabilities and take over a system, which we don't want happening. So in theory, uh, getting rid of this parser and using uh, just pre-compiled uh, vendor neutral shaders could be more secure and simply surely makes for simpler drivers. So there's a lot of excitement around Vulkan. It's very clearly an improvement on OpenGL, but I, there's no need for me to do two separate presentations, one on the OpenGL stack and one on the Vulkan stack, because beyond this surface level, they're essentially identical in terms of what's required from the kernel, the compiler, and so forth. Speaking of, what's the deal with these compilers? Why are there so many levels to them and layers, and what's going on here? And this is essentially a response to a very uh, deep tension in our compiler stacks, and especially in the open source compiler stack. And this is a unique challenge for us. On one hand, we want to have uh, separation of concerns. We want to have uh, different um, pieces of our compiler to be uh, hardware agnostic, so we can share them across all of our different pieces of hardware. Um, and believe me, there is very little in common between a modern Intel chip and an old ARM chip but they share the same compiler in Mesa, um, at least for a big chunk of it. So and we want to be able to do this code sharing. And there is this fundamental tension of uh, how do we have our cake and eat it too? And the answer is just having turtles all the way down the stack. We have uh, different intermediate representations, uh, different representations of the program uh, for different purposes. We have the representation of the GLSL code itself at the start, which is uh, there to facilitate the parsing and very early error checking. All of your syntax errors are all handled here. So we have one GLSL compiler that can be used identically or essentially identically for every piece of hardware ever. And this is one of the complicated parts of Mesa. So it's a good thing we only need one of them. Uh, we have our common intermediate representations, for example, the NUR representation uh, being the most important at this point, uh, where the goal is not to represent the original program faithfully. The goal is to be easy to optimize. And so whereas the GLSL intermediate representation is a tree-based representation modeling uh, how, what the source code of the program really looks like, and uh, and preserving all the variable names and all of that. NUR is a flat intermediate representation that's completely static single assignment form. So translating from GLSL to NUR uh, destroys the source level of the program, but it puts it into a form that's much easier to optimize uh, in the same way that translating from uh, Clang's abstract syntax tree into LLVMIR is required for all of the common LLVM optimizations, if you have experience on that compiler side. And finally, you have all of the different IRs for the different backends. Uh, for example, uh, I maintain the Bifrost uh, intermediate representation, which models Bifrost and more recently Valhalla hardware, uh, both GPUs from ARM. And uh, the Bifrost intermediate representation is much more difficult to optimize for doing the sorts of general purpose optimizations that NERC concerns itself with, but it models faithfully all of the different quirks about the uh, ARM Bifrost hardware, which means it's possible to write optimizations on Bifrost uh, in intermediate representation that take full advantage of the Bifrost hardware uh, without um, having to pollute the common code, so to speak. So having this tree of uh, intermediate representations uh, that chain together is really important. And this composability is essential to being able to maintain a compiler stack 
that can handle uh, multiple different APIs of input and a dozen different uh, instruction sets of output and be able to share code in the middle. And this is something that Mesa does really well. Uh, LLVM for the CPU also has the same challenges with a, the same sort of solution, although LLVM and NER are, uh, in some respects, very different. For an example of what this actually looks like, uh, here's a diagram of all of the different compiler paths that you would take with the Panfrost driver targeting the Molly hardware. In the simple case that I keep talking about, you start with OpenGL, you pass in a GLSL program that gets parsed into a GLSL abstract syntax tree uh, and translated into NUR. The NUR gets optimized and translated into a Panfrost specific intermediate representation, for example, the Bifrost intermediate representation, and then that gets translated into the hardware specific code. Fine. Uh, Vulkan is just as simple except instead of inputting GLSL and translating GLSL to NUR, you input SPURV and translate SPURV to NUR, which is a much simpler code path. But again, uh, Panfrost is completely agnostic to GLSL and SPURV because it just sees NUR input, and the GLSL and SPURV uh, front ends are all handled in completely common code shared across every driver, uh, which means there is a considerable simplification and cost reduction for developing open source drivers in Mesa as opposed to proprietary drivers. The OpenCL path is unfortunately much, much less nice. Uh, you have essentially C code input, OpenCLC, but C code, which means we have to go through Clang and have Clang output LLVM and then translate the LLVM into Spurvy, which is complicated. Some would say it's overcomplicated, but you really don't want to write your own um, C front end if you can help it, especially not a C++ front end, because yes, OpenCL C++ is a thing. Uh, so it's, you know, it turtles all the way down, but we do get Spurvy at the end of the day. And from Spurvy, we can use our common code path to translate into NUR. And once we have NUR, well, we can feed that into the back end and our backend, again, remains completely agnostic. So this is a uh, very nice way of seeing everything compose. Unfortunately, looking at the diagram of every Mesa compile path, or at least every one that I could fit on the screen, there are more, believe me, there are more. Uh, it's not so nice, uh, but you can see the same sorts of code paths coming up. You have the common uh, the common uh, direction, going from OpenGL to GLSL to NUR to the driver to the GPU. Uh, but there are other ways to input programs, including a number of legacy front ends that get handled totally transparently to the driver, uh, which allows us to implement legacy OpenGL features with no added work per driver, because it's all just common Mesa code. And there are older drivers that require older intermediate representations, for example, TGSI, which predates NUR. And then there are drivers which uh, really want to do their compiler in LLVM instead of in NUR, and will end up translating from NUR to LLVM, um, and then use an LLVM compiler as opposed to directly implementing a NUR compiler. Uh, this, is, this is fine. Um, it's not going to come up in the embedded world, but I felt it's uh, important to mention that uh, we do have a diversity of stacks even within the common code uh, or within the common Mesa tree. And uh, common code is not imposed with an iron fist. It's there for your own benefit. And it's a lot of benefit. And in total, you get a functional, somehow, <laughs> graphic stack. Uh, compilers with very little code, objectively, uh, that can target any of these different APIs, any of these different hardware. Uh, you can add APIs uh, with very little work because of the joy of common code, and you can maintain this uh, very easily, uh, including long-term. This is a very nice value proposition for and a very nice win for open source and for Linux. Um, and I'm uh, very thrilled to be part of this and to see this through. Um, so 
Thank you for listening, and I would love to answer questions. Thank you.